Well, thanks very much for, for organizing this conference and for including our, our paper on the program. So this is joint work with, with Kevin Novin and Will Peterman. And we have the usual disclaimer that the views in this paper are not necessarily the views of, of the faculty. So the US does not currently have a, a federal climate policy in place. And by that, I mean we don't have a nationwide tax on carbon emissions or a national cap and trade system. But there is widespread awareness that we could introduce a climate policy at some point in the future. And so, for example, if we just think back over the past decade or so, there have been several serious legislative attempts to get federal action on climate change in the US. Going back to 2009, the US passed the Waxman Market, the House passed the Waxman Market Bill, which, if it had also passed in the Senate, would have established a cap and trade system for the US. Then there was the Clean Power Plan under the Obama administration. And more recently, Biden has strongly signaled his interest in taking action on climate change by rejoining the, the Paris Climate Agreement and announcing the goal to reduce US emissions by about 50% by 2030. So we're going to use this term climate policy risk to refer to the possibility that we could introduce a climate policy at some point in the future. And we think this climate policy risk could have important implications for the macro economy because it affects firms' decisions to invest in long-lived capital assets, especially those that are used in, in conjunction with fossil fuels. So for example, think about a, a firm that wants to invest in a new coal boiler. The return on that coal boiler is going to be a lot lower if the government introduces a carbon tax in the future than if the government doesn't introduce that tax. So we can think of this climate policy risk as creating this downside risk for investment in things like coal boilers. But parallel but opposite reasoning would suggest that it creates upside risk for investment in things like solar panels. It's a large share of the US capital stock, about a fifth by our estimates, is, is kind of specialized to use fossil fuel. We think this policy risk could have important macro implications. And so that's what we're going to look at in this paper, is think about what are the effects of climate policy risk on the macro economy and that's going to operate through these implications for investment. And then we'll look at the resulting impact on emissions, output, and welfare. So to do this, we develop a general equilibrium model of climate policy risk in which entrepreneurs can invest in different types of capital, so like a clean capital and then a fossil capital. Throughout, I'm going to use a carbon tax as an example of that future climate policy. You should really view this though as kind of a stand-in for, for any sort of coordinated federal action on climate change, whether it be a carbon tax, a cap and trade system, or some kind of suite of, of regulations. And our general approach is going to be to study an equilibrium in which there is no carbon tax in place, but there's this chance that the government could introduce a carbon tax at some point in the future. And so what we find is that the risk of a future climate policy alone, even without the actual carbon tax in place, gives you a small reduction in emissions. And this emission reduction occurs because that policy risk is going to shift investment towards cleaner capital and reduce the total level of the capital stock. So in essence, we're reducing emissions, both because we're just producing less, and then what we are producing, we're producing more cleanly. This also will affect how we think about the cost of inaction on climate policy. In some sense, there's this silver lining in that we're reducing emissions even though we don't have an actual policy in place. But on the other hand, what we'll show is that this is a very costly way to reduce emissions through this policy risk relative to just using an actual tax. And then the last thing we'll do is, is compare our model to, to the kind of literature on the green paradox. And the literature on the green paradox comes up with the opposite prediction in the sense that they argue, or that literature argues, that the um, possibility of climate policy in the future will actually increase emissions today. And that rationale is coming from how, um, how policy risk affects the extraction incentives for fossil fuel, viewing fossil fuels as resource and in finite supply. So for the majority of our paper, we're going to take the um, the view that the, the scarcity constraints on fossil fuels are, are not binding. And so we're going to treat fossil fuels as a resource in infinite supply, so we won't have this green paradox mechanism. But then at the end, we're going to come back and say, what if we put the green paradox mechanisms into our model and run kind of a horse race between these two predictions? And what we'll find is that even if you allow for, for fossil fuel extraction to respond to the policy risk, the, the effect, the decrease in demand for fossil fuel coming from these investment side channels is going to dominate. And so we'll still find that um, policy risk reduces emissions today. So this relates to both the environmental literature, particularly that literature on the green paradox, and a macro literature on policy uncertainty. So what I'm going to do is start with the, with the simple model. And the purpose of the simple model is to highlight the different channels through which 
climate policy risks affects the economy. So for this case, the simple case, we'll just focus on the production side of the economy. So we'll think about a world inhabited by infinitely lived entrepreneurs that are making investment decisions to maximize expected lifetime profits. And these entrepreneurs have the opportunity to invest in two types of capital. First, there's a fossil capital. This is capital that either produces fossil fuels, so think like an oil rig, or requires fossil fuel to operate. So say a coal boiler, so something like a coal boiler. And using the, the uh, detailed data on capital assets from the, the National Income and Product Council, we find that about a fifth of the U.S. capital stock would fall in this fossil, fossil capital category. The opposite fossil capital, we have clean capital. And this is capital that's specialized either to replace fossil capital, so think like a solar panel instead of a coal boiler, or to replace fossil fuel. And by that, what we really have in mind are improvements in energy efficiency. So for example, if I put better insulation in my house, then I can use less fossil fuel for heating and cooling. So there'll be a unique final good, which is why, produced from a clean intermediate XC, a fossil intermediate XF, and then labor, which is just going to be fixed in an exogenous supply for our simple model. The clean intermediate is produced from clean capital, and the fossil intermediate is produced from a Leontief function of fossil capital and fossil fuel. Now, the Leontief implies that there's no substitutability between the fossil capital and the fossil fuel. If I have a coal boiler, I have to shovel in a certain amount of coal in order to produce the electricity. But, so in the model, all substitution away from fossil fuel is going to come through increases in clean capital. But remember that clean capital includes both improvements in energy efficiency and renewable energy, which empirically are the two ways that we can substitute away from fossil fuel. So we've just modeled the investment required for that substitution directly. And then again, for the majority of the paper, we're going to think about fossil fuel being produced, being a resource in an infinite supply. And so it's just produced from units of final good at a constant marginal cost. So what we'll do is we're, we're thinking about the US economy as being in this equilibrium in which we don't have a carbon tax in place, but there's this chance that we could introduce a carbon tax at some point in the future. So with probability one minus rho, we'll assume the government does not introduce the carbon tax. And so we would then stay in this equilibrium in which there's no tax in place, but there's risk of the tax in the future. Now with probability rho, the government does introduce the carbon tax. In that case, the economy begins the dynamic transition to a new long run equilibrium with a carbon tax in place. Now, since climate policies are at least designed to be permanent, we'll model that introduction of the, of the carbon tax as an absorbing state. And so once the carbon tax is introduced, all uncertainty is resolved, and that transition in the resulting policy studies, they are entirely deterministic. Now, of course, we can, you know, policies, climate policies are, are designed to be permanent, but they don't always end up that way. And so, you know, Australia's carbon tax was repealed after, after being in, uh, in place for two years is, is kind of a, a case in point there. And so what we do in the paper, what we won't go through in, in the talk, is show that that, that that assumption really isn't critical for the quantitative results. And if we think about policies ending after, you know, one, two, or three years, we get relatively similar effects. So what I want to do now is solve analytically for this steady state in which there's no carbon tax, but there's this chance that we could introduce the carbon tax in the future and look at how, um, how the allocation of capital affects, how, or how that policy risk affects emissions through, through its effects on capital. So this is showing you the ratio of clean to fossil capital in that steady state. Now for a minute, let's just pretend that the extraction cost of fossil fuel is, is zero and that there's no policy risk. So set this rho tau term to zero. Then the ratio of clean to fossil capital just equals the ratio of the factor shares in that Cobb Douglas production function. Now there is an operating cost, so let's make this zeta guard positive. In that case, sorry, an extraction cost of fossil fuel. That extraction cost of fossil fuel raises the operating cost of fossil capital, which shifts the economy more towards, towards clean capital, so increasing this ratio. Now the possibility of a future carbon tax, this term here, is going to do the same thing. It raises the expected operating cost of fossil capital, and so that also is going to shift the economy towards cleaner capital. So we see climate policy risk reducing emissions simply because it's changing the composition of capital. It's giving us more clean capital and less fossil capital. The other channel is what we'll think of as a level effect. And so this expression is showing you the total level of capital in the economy. And the important part here is that the level of capital is decreasing in this policy risk term. To understand the intuition, think about what an actual carbon tax does. An actual carbon tax is going to shift the economy away from the privately optimal, not the socially optimal, allocation of capital, which is going to reduce the marginal product of capital, which then in turn um, 
results in a lower total capital stock. Now, the possibility of a carbon tax in the future does the same thing in expectation, and that it reduces the expected marginal product of capital, leading to a lower capital stock. So in essence here, we see that policy risk is reducing emissions, both because um, we're just producing less, this is the level effect, and what we're all producing, we're producing more cleanly, which is that composition effect. So what I do next is kind of highlight two pieces of, of the quantitative um, quantitative model. So that's our simple model. And now to get some numerical realism, we'll, we'll make it a little more complicated. On the production side, we'll add a non-energy sector and we'll allow for labor to be allocated across the different sectors. And then we'll solve for the full general equilibrium in which risk averse households are making all the decisions. So on the production, we'll now think about output being produced from a CES function of three intermediate inputs, the clean, the fossil, and this new one, which is a non-energy intermediate. The non-energy intermediate is going to be produced from non-energy capital as well as labor. Now that non-energy capital accounts for all capital that we wouldn't necessarily classify as, as fossil, as not specialized to use or produce fossil fuel, and we also wouldn't classify it as clean and that it's not specialized to kind of replace fossil fuel. So for example, thinking about a sewing machine. A sewing machine requires electricity to operate, but the sewing machine doesn't care if that electricity is produced by a cold boiler or by a, a solar panel. So this sewing machine will classify as, what counts as, is this non-energy capital. The other change we've made, aside from adding more parameter values, is we're now allowing for the allocation of labor across these different intermediate inputs. And this is important because it's giving entrepreneurs another dimension along which to respond to the policy risk. And the kind of labor response is going to differ from the, the capital response because the timing of labor and capital decisions differ. In particular, you have to decide next period's level of capital, i.e. your investment, at the end of the current period, before you know if there's going to be a tax next period. But labor is a much more flexible input, and so we assume that you choose labor for the current period after you know whether or not there's a tax this period. So this labor choice lets you kind of mitigate the effects of climate policy risks. So for example, if I hired, had a lot of clean capital thinking there might be a tax, I find out there's not a tax, I might hire a little bit less labor than I would normally hire to go with that level of clean capital, to adjust my production ex post. The other piece here is now the economy is going to be inhabited by a continuum of infinitely lived identical households that are comprised of workers and entrepreneurs. The workers endogenously choose their labor supply, pick supply to any entrepreneur, and they earn the market wage. So our labor markets here are perfectly competitive. And entrepreneurs, like before, are producing intermediate inputs, and everyone is making decisions to, to maximize the expected lifetime welfare of the household. So we want to calibrate the model, and our goal again is to take the view that the U.S. economy is currently in this equilibrium in which we don't have a carbon tax in place, but there's this chance that we could introduce a carbon tax in the future. So we're going to set the size of that potential tax equal to $45 a ton, but in line with, with current policy proposals and, and estimates of, of the social cost of carbon. The time period is a year. And what I want to do in the interest of time is not go through the whole calibration, but try to give you a sense of how we're going to pin down as best we can the probability row that firms place on that $45 ton tax in the future. So what we observe when we look at the data is that U.S. firms are voluntarily reducing their emissions, kind of beyond what would be required by any sort of local level policy. And there are lots of different ways they, they do this. Um, but our, our general approach is to say, well, what if we can quantify those firms' um, abatement efforts? using a mechanism known as an internal carbon fee, which is simply a tax that the firm places on its emissions. And if we know how much firms are voluntarily reducing their emissions, then we want to say, okay, we see firms are doing this amount of emissions reduction voluntarily. What probability row would they have to place on that $45 tax so that that voluntary emissions reduction is, optim is the optimal response to climate policy risk it comes in the context of our model. And so what we find here is that rho is about 10%. And so there's kind of this 10% chance every year that we'll put on that $45 tax. Or put another way, this would imply about a, a kind of 50% chance that the US introduces such a tax in, within the next eight years. Okay, so I wanna turn next to, to our results. So the goal is to use the, the calibrated model to do three things. First, to show that climate policy risk gives you this small reduction in emissions, even though we don't have an actual policy in place. And that because this emissions reduction can affect how we think about the cost of an action on climate policy, 
And then finally, we'll come back and say, how does this compare to what if we bring in the green paradox? And can we run kind of a simplified horse race between our model and the, the predictions of the green paradox? So what we're going to do is compare three steady states. First is going to be a steady state in which there's no tax and there's no risk of, of a future tax. Second is going to be a steady state in which we have that $45 tax in place. That's our policy steady state. Comparing these two steady states provides a familiar point of reference. This is the exercise that's normally done in the, in the literature. Then to understand the effects of climate policy risk, we'll add in that third steady state in which there's no tax, but there is risk of a future tax. Specifically, there's this 10% chance of a $45 tax. Comparing the first and the third steady state lets us get at the effects of risk. So let's start with that familiar reference point. This says that when we put on the carbon tax, we reduce emissions by about 16, 15-16% relative to a world with no tax and no risk. And as you can see here, that emissions reduction is coming through that same level channel that we discussed before. The capital stock is lower and the composition channels the tax shifts the economy towards cleaner capital, labor, and intermediates, just like we talked about in the context of the policy risk. Now what I want to do is, is add to this graph what are the effects of just the risk of that $45 tax alone, not the actual tax. And so that's the blue bars. And the first thing to notice about the blue bars is they all move in the same direction as the green bars. And that there's the sense in which climate policy risk takes the economy partway to that long run steady state with the tax in place. Now, if we look to your focus just on emissions, what you see is that policy, the policy risk gives you a small reduction in emissions. And to put that in perspective, kind of the height of the blue bar there is about 8% the height of the green bar, meaning that 8% of the emissions reduction that we would get from actually putting on the tax, we get just from the possibility of the tax alone. Now, what I want to do next is zoom in on these, on these blue bars, because they're kind of hard to see with, with the green bars on the same graph. So these are the same blue bars, but we've changed the, the y-axis. And what you can see here is that climate policy risk is operating through, again, the level effect, so we have just less capital, and through the composition effect to reduce, um, to reduce emissions. Now, notice here with the composition effect that the that climate policy risk leads to a larger increase in the ratio of clean to fossil capital than it does in the ratio of clean to fossil labor. And that's coming back to the different timing of the capital and labor decisions. Again, I have to decide clean capital when I, before I know whether or not the government has introduced that carbon tax. After I learn the government didn't introduce the carbon tax, I can hire a little bit less labor to kind of adjust my, my production ex post. So you see clean to fossil labor rising by less than clean to fossil capital. What this is going to imply is that climate policy risk distorts the capital labor ratio and that it creates this kind of misallocation of capital and labor. So what I think about next is how does reducing emissions through policy risk compare to reducing emissions through an actual tax? And so what we do is we solve for the tax that would give you the exact same emissions reduction that we're getting under this policy risk. And that tax equals $3.21 a ton. And then we can compare how the tax operates through those levels and composition channels differently from the risk. And so those are the remaining bars. And the key point here is that look at that level effect. The tax is relying much less on the level effect to reduce emissions than policy risk. Put another way, that means that the tax is relying less on just shutting down production to reduce emissions and kind of more on shifting that econ the economy towards cleaner capital, which is going to in turn make the tax a much less costly way to, to reduce emissions. Now, there are a couple of reasons why the, the level effect is higher under, under policy risk, or policy risk leads to a larger reduction in capital. The one I want to highlight here comes back to the, to the kind of different responses in the ratios of clean to fossil capital and clean to fossil labor. And in particular, we see that clean to fossil, um, under the tax, there's no uncertainty. And so notice the height of, of these purple bars is all the same. That the different timing of the capital and labor decisions doesn't matter, and so the tax doesn't distort the, the capital labor ratio. But the policy risk does distort the capital labor ratio. And that distortion further reduces the marginal product of capital, which is part of what gives you that larger level effect under the tax. So I want to think about what are the implications of this policy risk for the cost of, of inaction on climate change. And again, in some sense, maybe there's kind of a silver lining here in that the costs of inaction are smaller than we thought because we're getting small emissions reduction just from the chance of that policy, even though we don't actually have the policy in place. But what we can show is, you know, there are costs of this risk too. And using a consumption equivalent variation measure of welfare, 
we find that climate policy risk is about twice as costly as that $3.21 tax. There are a couple reasons for this higher cost. First is that households are risk averse, so they just don't like that cost. And second is that larger level effect, and that policy risk is relying more on just shutting down production and hence reducing consumption than the taxes to reduce emissions. Now, when we first started this paper, we had this notion that, you know, if, if agents anticipate that we might introduce a carbon tax in the future, maybe that would make the welfare cost over the transition lower than if agents don't anticipate that. And the kind of reasoning there being that because we, we anticipate the, the uh, possibility of a carbon tax, the economy has already done some of the, some of the adjustment. And what we find is that actually that's not true, and that the welfare cost of introducing a carbon tax, beginning from a world in which um, uh, agents would anticipate that we could do this, so in that steady state with risk, is almost exactly the same as if we were to begin from a steady state with, with no risk, and the agents can don't anticipate. And the reason is that there are these two offsetting channels. First, if you start in that steady state with risk, it is true that the economy, you know, some of the adjustment has already taken place. And so that itself is going to lower the, the welfare costs. But then offsetting that is if you start in that steady state with risk, the level effect implies that you have a lower capital stock. And this means you're less able to just save over that transition period, and that's going to increase the red welfare costs. And those two effects almost perfectly offset. And so the welfare costs of introducing a carbon tax are virtually the same, whether you begin in that steady state in which agents understand that there's this risk of a future tax, or if you begin in a steady state where there's, where there's no risk. So the last thing that I want to do is, is think about our paper in the context of the, of the literature on green, the green paradox. And this is important because we, we have different or opposite really predictions for the effects of, of policy risk um, on emissions. And that our paper is finding that because of these investment responses, policy risk uh, reduces emissions today. Whereas the green paradox is arguing that policy risk increases emissions today. And the papers are kind of beginning from different starting points and that the green paradox uh, is, is starting from this world where we're thinking about fossil fuels as being in finite supply. And then the effect of, um, of policy risk on extraction incentives for that finite resource is critical to this argument that policy risk is going to increase emissions today. And so what I want to do is first just walk through the intuition from the, the green paradox literature and then show how that both first compares to our model and then how we can incorporate those green paradox mechanisms into our model to run kind of a horse race between these two opposite predictions. So the backbone of the green paradox uh, literature is a hoteling type model of, of fossil fuel supply. And so what I've plotted here is this um, D is just showing you demand for fossil fuel. MEC is the marginal extraction cost, which I've set to be um, to be constant. And now the price of fossil fuel is, is above that, um, that marginal extraction cost because of the, of, the, of the scarcity rents that you would get in a hoteling model. Then the picture on the Five right minutes. is that. Okay, thank you. The picture on the right is the, is the same graph, but move forward um, one period in time. And then you have the standard hoteling type prediction that the price of fossil fuel is rising at the rate of interest. So now let's think about uh, the effects of policy risk in this, in this setting. So policy risk was going to reduce expected demand for fossil fuels tomorrow. So that's shifting that demand curve to the left, which in turn then reduces the expected profitability of extracting that finite resource tomorrow. Now fossil fuel extractors are solving this dynamic optimization problem. So if it's less profitable to extract tomorrow, then they're going to choose to pull extraction forward and extract more today. So we see fossil fuel extraction and hence emissions increasing today and the price falling. And so this is this green, the sense of the green paradox in which we're get, they're getting this result that um, possibility of future climate policy is actually going to, um, to increase emissions. Now, what does our paper say? Our paper says, well, if we think about the possibility of climate policy in the future, that's actually going to reduce demand for fossil fuel today because it reduces changes the composition of capital, shifts the economy towards the, the cleaner capital, and it reduces the total level of the capital stock. So we're arguing that we get this leftward shift in demand, and all else equal, that leftward shift in demand is going to reduce fossil fuel, um, fossil fuel consumption today instead of increasing that consumption. And so now it comes down to this question of, well, which effect is bigger? This is supply side response where fossil fuel um, extractors choose to, to move extraction um, to today and extract more, 
or this demand side response where the kind of changes in investment patterns imply that we demand less fossil fuel today because of the risk of policy in the future. So to think about this or put this in our model, what we're going to focus on is the effects of, um, of policy risk on fossil fuel prices when we're not in this world where um, when we have this, this hoteling type model of fossil fuel extraction. So this graph on the right is showing our model as we've set it up. And in our model, we don't have the hoteling like dimensions. And so the price of fossil fuel is always going to equal the marginal extraction cost, whether we're in that steady state with risk or in the steady state without risk. Now we have to bring in the green paradox. Now the price of fossil fuel is higher than that marginal extraction cost because of the scarcity rents. And importantly, it's going to differ between the steady state with risk and the steady state without risk. So the red here is showing you the price of fossil fuel in the steady state without risk. And we're arguing that that's going to be larger than in the steady state risk with risk for two reasons. First, as we move from the steady state without risk to the steady state with risk, we see demand for fossil fuel fall. That's our investment channel. That decrease in demand is going to push down this price. The other thing that's happening is, again, as we move from the steady state with risk to steady state without risk, is that our fossil fuel extractors are choosing to extract more today because it might be less profitable in the future. That increase in supply is also pushing down this price. And so to bring in the green paradox, we're going to allow for the price of fossil fuel in the steady state with risk to be lower than the price of fossil fuel in the steady state without risk. Now the question becomes, well, how much should these prices differ? And for that, we'll draw on the empirical literature on the, on the green paradox. So there are two uh, really nice papers on this. The first one by Derek Lemoyne is looking at how um, changes in the probability that Congress passed uh, the Waxman-Markey bill, which would have established a cap and trade system for the US, or not um, changes in, sorry, the level of congressional support for, for, that, for the Waxman-Markey bill affects coal, uh, coal prices. And then the second paper, which is, um, by Kyle Meng is taking that one step further and saying changes, how do changes in the, um, in the effect on um, uh, changes in congressional support for the bill affect the probability that the bill is passed. And so combining these, these two, we get this result that um, we can get how do changes in the probability of a cap and trade system for the US affect, uh, affect coal prices. And so drawing on their evidence, we find that reducing the probability of um, Actually, moving the probability, say, from, from zero, which is what it would be in our steady state without policy risk, to 0.1, which is in our steady state with policy risk, would imply that the fossil fuel prices is, is 2.5% lower in that steady state with policy risk. And so that's what we'll do. So we just bring in, um, run our same experiment as we did before, but this time to see, does policy risk reduce emissions? We're going to allow for the fossil fuel price in that steady state with policy risk to be two and a half percentage points lower than in the steady state without. And when we do that, we find that climate policy risk is still reducing emissions, but by less than it was in our, in our baseline case. And this is you know, what you would expect because this green paradox is, is sort of pushing in the other direction. So all this is to say that even we account for, for these green paradox mechanisms, we still see that this demand side response through investment dominates and climate policy risk reduces, gives you a small reduction in emissions. So just to conclude, what we've done here is show that climate policy risk gives you a small reduction in emissions today, affects how we think about the cost of inaction. And when we think about this in the context of green paradox, we kind of get the opposite result. Now, over time, it's possible that pressure for, for climate policy could increase in the future, perhaps as um, you know, climate change becomes more salient. And if this is the case, we show in the paper that as, um, as the effects of climate policy grow, we see um, larger consequences from, from effects of climate policy risk also, also increase and becomes more important. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our discussant is Lena Boneva from the ECB. Lena, the floor is yours. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, let me uh, share my slides. We can see your slides. There is some strange, oh, the strange boxes disappeared. Okay, let me just make them full screen. <laughs> 
Okay. Can, Perfect. We can see them. You have 10 minutes. Let me just uh, redo the full screen because I think it cut off um, some part. Okay. Here we go. First of all, let me thank the organizers for inviting me to this very interesting conference. I very much enjoyed reading Steffi's paper. And to those of you who have not done so yet, I very much recommend you to read it. It's really a pleasure to read. In my view, there are three key contributions of the paper. So the, the authors develop a novel dynamic general equilibrium model and use that model in order to quantify the impact of climate policy risk on emissions, welfare, and investment. A key ingredient of the model is firms' belief about the possibility of a future carbon tax. And the authors use a novel data set on internal carbon fees in order to calibrate these parameters in the model. And finally, the model is then used to uncover the transmission mechanisms at work through which climate policy risk affects the macroeconomy. Here are the key findings. First, if you're a policymaker, it might be enough to actually make firms believe that you're going to implement a carbon tax in the future. That's going to be enough to reduce emissions. So there is no green paradox. And so you don't have to go all the way to actually implement the carbon tax if you are just after reducing emissions. And that's because climate policy risk reduces the expected return of brown relative to green capital and also lowers the expected marginal product of capital. So these are the level and composition effects. Steffi explained very well. However, if you're a policymaker, it turns out that reducing emissions by making firms believe you're going to implement a carbon tax in the future is not a good idea because the welfare costs of doing so are very large compared to actually implementing the carbon tax. And that's because in the model with risk, the capital stock is inefficiently low in addition to risk averse households. As I uh, already mentioned, it's a, a great paper and I very much enjoyed reading it. However, I have three comments. The first one is on how Steffi and her co-authors calibrate the probability of a future climate policy in the model, which is really key to obtaining the results. And because the paper is already in a very advanced stage, so it's very clearly written, it has lots of robustness tests. My other two comments are offering some ideas on how Steffi and her co authors could uh, proceed on their research agenda. Yes, so, and these are essentially uh, if climate policy risk matters empirically and also one point about central banks and if they should respond to climate policy risk. Now, coming to my first comment. This uh, probability of uh, future climate policy is really key, key to the model. It's the key novelty the authors develop and add on to an otherwise pretty standard uh, dynamic general equilibrium model. And in order to uh, discipline uh, this parameter, the authors use a novel data set on in internal carbon fees. However, I thought the sample they use is pretty small, so it's just six firms and also pretty unrepresentative. Uh, the, the carbon fee used in, in the model is 10 US dollar. And I thought that seemed rather low in comparison to some most recent data I found. So here is a table I took from a recent report by the Carbon Disclosure Project. And they put the median price, price of uh, an internal carbon fee on 18 US dollar, which is almost twice the number used in Steffi's model. And also that table reveals there's a huge 
dispersion of internal carbon fees among firms with the maximum price of over 500 US dollars. So keeping that in mind, I was wondering if you could um, essentially use this most recent data to recalibrate the probability of a future climate policy. And ideally base your analysis on a larger number, larger sample of firms, given how important the parameter is in your model. And now the table also revealed this huge dispersion in the internal carbon fees. So given that, I was wondering if you could essentially report ranges for your key results based on, for example, the index volatile range of the observed carbon fees. And finally, when reading the paper, it was not entirely clear to me if the uh, carbon fee data is covering scope one, two, or three emissions. So that would be useful to clarify and ideally reporting results for all uh, different scopes. And again, data on that is available uh, in, in the report uh, cited on the previous slide. Now, coming to my second point. Uh, so I think Steffi uh, did a great job in convincing us that climate policy risk does matter in her model. But I was wondering if climate policy risk also matters empirically. You know, there's a huge literature on investigating the macro effects of, um, of different types of uncertainty using empirical methods, starting from the seminal paper of Bloom, but lots of uh, recent papers, including some uh, cited by Steffi in her paper and, and presentation. And uh, I was wondering if you could essentially corroborate your model-based results with uh, some uh, empirical estimates uh, where you uh, essentially assess the effect of climate policy risk on the macroeconomy, on capital, on investment, on emissions, using uh, methods like uh, structural vectorial regressions or local projections. Now, clearly, measuring climate policy risk in such an uh, empirical approach is a very uh, difficult task. But I do think this challenge can be overcome and uh, uh, I do offer uh, some ideas. So for example, you could use a textual approach by searching newspapers for uh, keywords like climate policy risk, future carbon tax and the like. And uh, um, in addition, you could also um, use uh, survey data. For example, there are polls uh, on, on climate policy carried out by the Carbon Tax Center, and you could uh, use dispersion in a survey respondents view on uh, future climate policy uh, to essentially gauge uh, climate policy risk uh, empirically. Or you could uh, take a narrative approach, um, essentially narratively identify events associated with expected uh, unexpected changes in climate policy risk and ideally normalizing those uh, with movements in green asset prices. Um, and finally, uh, some countries and regions uh, are already running um, different carbon pricing schemes and you could also use observed volatility in, in these carbon prices over the short or, or long run. And of course, there are also lots of different approaches, including uh, approaches followed by some of the papers uh, cited uh, in, in Steffi's presentation. Now, coming to my uh, final comment, I thought with the ECB co-hosting this conference, I should say something about monetary policy as well, clearly stressing here that uh, the views here in this presentation are my own personal views and should not be uh, taken to represent the ECB or the Euro system. First of all, so here my comment is, um, it, uh, it would be very interesting to um, essentially assess in a model-based framework how central banks should respond to climate policy risk. I think this is a highly relevant question, also given the ongoing ECB strategy review, and it can be answered in a model fairly closely related to, to the one you, you did present. And 
For example, one approach to tackle this question would be to add some Lucasian features to your model uh, and ideally also model climate policy risk as a stochastic uh, shock as done by previous uh, work. Alternatively, you could also set up a model uh, for optimal policy where you assume that um, there's imperfect knowledge about climate policy shocks. So essentially in a model firms would pay only limited attention to what politicians say. Uh, the pen, you know, regardless which approach is taken, it would be interesting to study optimal monetary policy in response to, to climate policy shocks, both uh, assuming the policymaker acts with discretion or, or commitment, and obviously, from a practitioner's perspective, it would be very interesting to see how close uh, optimal policy uh, is to a policymaker following a simple Taylor rule, uh, for example. Now, with that, let me conclude. I think uh, it's a really great paper addressing a highly relevant policy question. I do think there uh, is some scope to improve the probability uh, to prove how staffing causes calibrate the probability of future climate policy, given that this parameter is really key to the results. And I'm very much looking forward to the next paper on this research agenda. And I did offer two ideas which the authors might uh, want to consider in the future. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to uh, Steffi's uh, response. Thank you very much, Lena. Uh, we also have one question from Eric Puig. Um, what if the global energy demand grows faster than green energy supply? Uh, how would that impact your results? Um, so, Steffi, you have one minute to react to Lena's comments and to reply to Eric. Please uh, choose what you would like to do. You can always use the chat to reply to the question. You're muted. Awesome. I think what I want to do is, is just say a lot of thank yous to um, to Lena, and those are those are just fantastic ideas. And so we um, to ask you for your slides, but those are definitely things that we should look at. And I'm really excited that there's this new um, new data on on internal fees that maybe we can we can use. And I think using a range is is a, is a fantastic idea. So I I really appreciate those thoughts. And you know how 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 you know central banks should should start thinking about responding to this policy risk is is also I think a a fascinating question and you know what sense is it different from from other types of risk and what sense is it similar and so those are those are also really great great suggestions so thank you for for reading it so carefully and and, and coming up with those ideas on the question on what if now i forgot which was bigger the green i'm going to answer the question in the chat when i can read it again but um but thank you all very much and thanks thanks for coming